Hey, good evening. Shavua Tov to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here in Beth Jacob. This is the place to be, better than the movies, better than anywhere else, to be here, to hear Harav Harashi, Chief Rabbi Yisrael Mayor Lau. It's just been an amazing experience over Shabbat to have the Rav and Rabbi Lau together with us. Rav Lau, with your presence and the Rabbinit's presence, and Rav Lau, your words of Torah, you've really elevated and energized our city. And I hope that, and I know that many of you are with us uh, this morning. We had a packed house this morning in the shul. It was just an incredible energy, um, a great feeling and atmosphere in the shul. And Rav Lau gave a very powerful uh, drasha that moved all of us. Um, and many people have commented to us that this is sort of one of those memorable moments of all time and all their time here in Los Angeles and in Beth Jacob, that they were impacted, uh, Harav Lau, by your presence and by your message. Chief Rabbi Lau um, is now currently the Chief Rabbi of Tel Aviv. Um, he was the Chief Rabbi of Israel. He won the Israel Prize around 10 years ago, which is an incredible honor, well-deserved honor. And just the way he's been impacting and influencing all of us over the course of the last couple of days and, and also this evening, this is the way that he's impacted and influenced so many people from the religious and the not as religious, um, the Haredi Datilu Mi in Israel and in America, in communities worldwide when he speaks at March of the Living each year. For how many years now? 30. 26 years, Rav Lau is always the speaker uh, to thousands of students on the March of the Living trip. Just one of the ways that he shares his incredible life story, incredible knowledge uh, with, with students in their formative years. Um, so the topic for this evening is uh, bringing spirituality into a secular world, which is what Rav Lau has been doing, bringing spirituality for Am Yisrael and to our world. And it's a pleasure and an honor, and thank you so much for being here, to introduce Harav Yisrael Mayor Lau. Thank you. Shavua Tov. Fifty years ago, there was a cut-off relationship between Israel and the Soviet Union of that time. Soviet Union, even after Stalin, there was Khrushchev, after a short time of Malenko, Molotov, and Berrier, who remembers, the Iron Curtain was made of iron. We couldn't cross the curtain. No way for an Israeli to go to the Soviet Union or for a Soviet Union Jew to come to Israel. Prisoners of Zion like Natan Sharansky, Yuri Edelstein, Ida Nudel, and many, many others, Silva Zalmanson, they tried to kidnap an airplane in Leningrad, today St. Petersburg, to come to Israel. They were kept, they were sentenced for death for many, many years in jail, Siberia. You remember the whole story of let my people go, all the demonstrations. There was one exception which enabled Israelis to go to Russia, Moscow, and to be there a few days, Israelis. Officially, not underground. Because there is a body called PIFA. PIFA is international group to organize football matches between nations, national teams. And from heaven it happened that Israel will be in the same group with Russia with the Soviet Union. According to the law of PIFA, PIFA is a very strong organization, Minashamayim, heavenly. <coughs> so they had no choice. The Soviet authorities have enabled a team from Israel, football players, to come to Moscow and to play in Dynamo Stadium of Moscow. 
60,000 people there. It's Sunday. We had a team of 18 players. And as you know, in our organizations, to these 18, there were another Parmaim Chai, 36. One was a doctor, one was a massagist, but all the others were representatives of Maccabi, of Aboel, of Beitar, or politicians. But around 50 people were allowed to enter to the Soviet Union. To speak about the, uh, the match from the 60,000 participants there, there were at least 50,000 Yid <laughs> who came from Tashkent, from Bukhara, from the edge of Georgia to the Kazakhstan to see the Maccabim of this time. That was the title. We gave them a jacket in blue, pants white, like our flag, Kahol Lavan, blue and white. The menorah was on the pocket here. And they're nice boys. And David Ben Gurion insisted on that all the players will arrive to Moscow with Hebrew Israeli names. Yaakov Khodorov. Khodorov? Even it's a nice name in Russia. Yaakov Hod. Hod Vehadar. Amatsya Levkovich. Amatsya Lavi. A liar. Nahum Stelmach became Nahum Peled. Plada. Yosale Merimovich. Yosef Mor, Yosale Goldstein, Yosef Paz, Gold. The excitement was great. In Israel especially, and even there. When the Red Army, his orchestra, had to play Hatikva in Dinamo Moscow in stadium, and all the 60,000 people stood up, there was no one eye dry. No one. Yid. They saw the Maccabims and they sang a tikva together with the orchestra of the Red Army, the communists, playing Lo Avda Tikvateinu Eretz Zion Yerushalayim. Can you imagine? We lost. And how much we lost, I remember very well. Zero, five. <laughs> Don't worry. When they gave off on a revenge, they came to Ramat Gan, to Israel. And there, Nahum Stelmar gave a goal. And we lost only one against two. <laughs> so we lost twice. But zero five is not one two. That's the difference between diaspora and Israel. <laughs> but by it, in our home, we gave them a go. But this is not the point. The point is this meeting of survivors of both survivors of Hitler and survivors of Stalin. There is a Jewish state. And they are young people, Israelis, proud, nice, handsome. It was a feeling of pride in the hearts. People whom I have met many years later, and they told me their impression. But I want to tell you about one day before the match. The great synagogue called Yaakov, not Beit Yaakov, but called Yaakov, the voice of Jacob in Archipova Street in Moscow, five minutes walk from the Red Square. Shabbat, because the, the match took place on Sunday, 
So the prayers came already before Shabbat. White yarmulkes, couples, and they had to push themselves inside the shul. The shul was packed with thousands of people from all the 15 republicans of the Soviet Union, 15. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, 15, of course, Belarus, Ukraine. They wanted to touch an Israeli and a nice boy with a white biabulka with the menorah on his pocket, touch, just to touch them. They entered, but the disappointment was great. One of them, the players, Amatsya Levkovich, who told me later when he came back, I knew him from Tel Aviv. He had tears in his eyes when he told me the story. We disappointed our brothers in the Soviet Union. One of the players have got an aliyah. Ya He told him, you have to climb up the three stairs, they called you to the Torah. He came to the Torah, but he didn't know to make the bracha. Baruch Hu et Hashem Since his bar mitzvah, past 10 years, for the bar mitzvah, he was ready to say the bracha. But 10 years later, and no one stupidly didn't prepare them. If they will call you, don't disappoint the Eden. Say, Baruch Ata Hashem Hashem Bachar Banu Mikol Amim Noten Torah. Say it. He didn't know. He was crying when he told me the story. Amatia. It was a scandal in the whole state of Israel. Everyone spoke about this disappointment, lack of Jewish education. Mainly you are secular, secular. But to make a bracha, aliyah le Torah, especially if you go abroad and you know that you represent the state of Israel. The Minister of Education and Culture of that time, from the Labour Party, a close friend to David Ben-Gurion, was Zalman Aran. Aran, formerly Aronovich. He was the General Secretary of the Union before the establishment of the State of Israel, and then he became the Minister of Education and Culture. Very capable man, very. Look at the story. Tell you in details. He made a session and a consulate with all the leaders of the Ministerium of Education, said it must be changed. He, very secular. But not to know. Aliyah le Torah, not to know to hold a Sidur, a prayer book, Israelis, this is our education. He made a new profession in every gymnasium and every elementary school. Toda'a Yehudit, Jewish knowledge. They made a program what to teach, how to teach it, to tell them what is tefillin, what is talit, and why, how to hold the sidur, shacharit, mincha, ma'ariv, weekday, shabbat, to tell them the principles of Yiddishkeit, Judaism. Next year, all the classes in all the schools all over the state must learn Toda'a Yehudit. 
I saw in my very eyes in a school in Petah Tikva, an elementary school called Pika, the sixth class, children of 12 years old, before Bat or Bar Mitzvah, the teacher, lady teacher, came to the school with a bag of tefillin and wrote on the blackboard, tefillin. This is on the left arm and this is on your head. Unfortunately, she didn't know that inside of this box is written Shema Israel. She knew that this is here, this is there, but the children didn't get it. I look at the faces of the children, boys and girls. Okay, tefillin, tefillin, but what is it? Why is it? What is the meaning of it? She lost the case just because she didn't know herself, a teacher. Shema Israel. She said, elementary, this is our own term. But he tried. Zalman Aran tried to do his best. His nickname was from Russia, Ziyama. Zalman was Ziyama Aronovich. And then comes a story inside of this story. There was a debate in Academy Van Leer in Jerusalem, Shabotinsky Street, near the president's house. Youth and tradition. I was one of the participants, and the other one, Morale Baron. I don't even know how many of you know the name. Morale is also a nickname of Mordechai Baron. He was a general. He was the head officer of education in IDF, in Zwagan Ali Israel. Later he was a member of the Knesset, from the leftist wing. He was later a member in the Jewish agency, the head of the department youth, and some other things in the Jewish agency. A very, very important guy, far from religion. He was on one side, and I am on the second. Academia van Leer, the <coughs> question was who will speak first? I said, morally is older, let him, I will answer. He stood up and told the story. After his story, I didn't have what to add. People were mixed, religious and secular, all kinds in Yerushalayim, Cholamo and Sukkes, even a Shtraimli you could find them. All kinds. Sitting there, I hear to Morale Baron, and I thought that I don't hear when. He said, do you remember Toda'a Yehudit of Zalman Aran, Minister of Education and Culture? Everyone remembers. I will tell you, I was that time the officer of education in Sahal, IDF. I was asked first time in my life to come to Jerusalem and to meet with the Minister of Education and Culture. I was in his party, the labor. I was even more left than him. He was in the center, but we, were, we belonged to the same group. But what minister, what does he want from me? He said to me, Morale, I will tell you why I called you. You remember the story of the footballist in Dynamo Stadium in Moscow? You remember the scandal that they didn't know to make Aliyah le Torah? I have organized for all the schools in Israel Jewish knowledge, Tadayu did. 
but this is good for the young Jews today. But those who are in the army already, those who are in the army, they missed the religious education. They didn't hear it in the school. I want you to complete in the army service what they lost in the 12 years of school. Three years the boys are in the army, two years the girls. I will give you all the budget you need. You have to prepare a program. Who will teach it, when and how? Give me the program, tell me what is the budget, and I cover. I want them to know what it means to be a Jew. Not only who is a Jew, but what does it mean to be a Jew. I looked at him, Morale tells it in Vernier, in the, in the symposium. I looked at him, very strange. Maybe he became old. <laughs> Maybe he thinks about his world to come. Maybe he wants to make sure that he has a pair, a, a, some place in the paradise. What brings Morale Baron from the Union, friend of Ben Gurion, secular, secular labor, to speak about if they didn't learn Yiddishkeit in school, in the army? Army is built to teach Jewish knowledge, talents and film. The army, I looked at him very strange, but I didn't say a word because respect. But he was very smart. He caught my eye. He understood very well. I said, Morale, don't worry. I am far of it. <laughs> don't worry. I am not a Baal Shuva. I don't return. How far I am? I will tell you from my own experience. And he told him a story. This is a story in a story in a story. <laughs> what is the story of, of uh, Zalman Aran to Mora Lebaron? World War I, 1917, before the revolution of the communists on November 17. Lenin, Stalin, before. We fought against the German, as usual. World War I. We were with no equipment in a field somewhere in Russia. Open in a field of flower. The Messerschmitts and the Spitfires, the airplanes of the German attacked us while being in the field. We didn't have even one cannon to threaten them. And they started to shoot with gun machines from the aircraft. And all of a sudden, I feel pain in my leg. I look at my leg, it was the left leg, a geyser of blood splitting out. I was injured. A bullet, whatever, met my leg. I tried to use both arms in one hand to dig a pit for myself, because they are turning around again and again, the Spitfires and the Messerschmitts. And I have no shelter, no place where to escape. They are going to kill me. I tried to dig a pit and enter into the pit. And in the other hand, I wanted to stop this bleeding. I had a bandage. I failed in both. I didn't dig, and I couldn't stop the bleeding. And I saw dark and dark stains in my eyes, and I felt that I am going down and down, losing consciousness. I don't see anything. Hardly that I hear something. And I understood that this is my final moment in life. Spontaneously, 
I have heard a voice inside of me. Ziyama! Zog epis in Yiddish. Say something, which means pray. Ziyama! Say something! You have no other choice. No other will help you. You are dying. Till 17, I was a yeshiva boy. I've learned in yeshiva. Then I became a kind of a communist, joined the party, the army. I knew everything by heart, the whole city. But at the second moment, I heard another voice. Ziyama, don't be a hypocrite. You showed him your back in the last years. Now when you need him, you apply to him. A shame on you. Don't do it. You have chosen a way. You escaped from him. Go in your way. Don't turn back. And I didn't pray. Morale Baron tells us what Zalman Aran told him, you understand that I am far, far from religion. But I want them, the children, to know. I knew. They don't. I want them to know. I will give them the equipment. What they will do with it, how they will use it, is their problem. But I, as minister of education and culture in a Jewish state, I have to give, give them the equipment. This is the story that Morale heard from Ziyama. But now Morale goes on and says, Mr. Aran, I am very touched from your story. Also because it reminds me a story of my own. And here you heard the false. <laughs> October 29, 1956. The Sinai War. They called it the Suez Canal War. Together with England and France. Sahar. Why did they do it? Ben Gurion was the Prime Minister and Minister of Defense at the time. Because they were mechablim, at that time they used to be called fadayun, terrorists. And they killed Jews in the buses. And they entered in Ma'ariv, time of prayer of Ma'ariv, to Kfar Chabad. Ten kilometers from Tel Aviv. Fifty kilometers from Yerushalayim. On the road, that time, was the only road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, crossing near Kfar Chabad. There were youth from Morocco, Aliyat Anwar, who were brought up in Kfar Chabad. The guide, Simcha Zilberstrom, Hashem Ikom Damo, was a survivor of Buchenwald, came with me on the same boat to Eretz Israel in 1945. And he became the madrich, the guide of Aliyat Anwar, but in the name of Chabad, in Kfar Chabad. They dubbed Mariv. The terrorists came in and threw in pomegranates. Pomegranates. They killed five. Simcha Zilberstrom and four kids. I could see the Sidur, one of the Sidurim, with stains of blood on the words, Hashkiveinu, Hashem Elokeinu Lishalom. Behamideinu Malkeinu Lechaim, full of blood of the children. Ben Gurion had decided no more. The same October 29th, the tanks of Tsahal 
invaded to the Gaza Trip. Aza, Rafiyah, Khan Yunus, Raskuntila, El Arish, all of a sudden. Morale Baron now is his turn to tell the story. I was a commander of a battalion. Magad, Mefaked, Gdud. Before the tanks, there was a command car. I was in that command car. No roof, open. There is a window. In the left hand, I held myself standing in that command car going to Gaza. The right hand, I had a yellow flag, a green flag, excuse me. Green flag with the flag I showed the tanks behind me where to go. I was the ways. <laughs> or to stop, this is an Israeli invention. It comes maybe from there. The green flag of the Magad, Mefaked Agdud, all of a sudden it was already dark. A bomb from the Egyptian sea met my command car. Pieces of the command car were in air. And I was thrown away many, many meters with the flag in my hand. No command car. And I am on earth, on the soil of Egypt already. And bleeding from all parts of my body. Look at my face, Morale said at the symposium, full with holes from that event, from 56. All his body with holes, pieces of granite. And I was laying on the grass, dark, and I hear my tanks going on and almost on me. I will be killed by our tanks. They couldn't see me. And I hear the voice stronger and stronger and I'm helpless, laying there in the grass. And I said to myself spontaneously, morale. Titpalel. Pray. Rakuya Cholazolacha. Only him can help you. No one others. Say something. And you know, Mr. Aran, Mr. President, Mr. Minister, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to say. I wanted, I desired, I couldn't. This is the, the difference between our two generations. You were in the same situation in Russia, 1917. I was in such a situation, 1956 in Israel. You knew how to pray, but you refused. I wanted to pray, but I couldn't. I stood up, told Morale, gave the hand to the minister and said, I'm with you, with this Toda you did. I will help you, I support it. I will never forget these moments that how miraculously I survived. I don't know how that I can hear you and speak to you and be here alive, I wanted to pray. For my soldiers, I will do my best to let them know how to pray. This was the part of Morale in that symposium. He had to represent secularism. And I had to answer him from the religious point of view. 
I stood up from my chair and kissed him on his face. I think everyone cried. I wanted to pray. I didn't know how. I will help you. This is the story of Salman Aram, Morale Baron. At the end of this story, in the gallery of Van Leer Academy, stood up a young man, like a breast of a horse, with a long coat, long jacket, black head, pears, stood up and said, at this moment, everyone was under the influence of the story of Moral Baron stood up and said, excuse me for interrupting the session, but I must confess and identify myself. I am the grandson of Zalman Aran Zichronoli Bracha. A of a His grandfather didn't want to say a prayer. A grandson is a breast of a chusin in Yerushalayim. said, in memory of my grandfather, I have to introduce myself. I am the grandson of Zalman Aran, Zichro Livracha. Okay, I think that I can finish. Here you go. <laughs> now, to the point. This was only the preface. <laughs> I am one of the crazy people you met. Because I don't know another example to compare with my past. I'm the only one, so far as I know, <coughs> after studying in Yeshivot 10 years, straight from Ponovich Yeshiva, Rav Kahneman, Rav Shach, Rav Povarsky, Rav Rozovsky, after that Yeshiva, to be a teacher of Tanakh and Talmud in two secondary school colleges in Petah Tikva, one named Achad Ha'am, the other one Brenner. Brenner, they didn't open the school on the 1st of May. This is the festival of the communism. <laughs> Brenner, socialist. They didn't call you Mr., not Rabbi, and not the last name. First name, Kamarat, Haverim, Israel. All the teachers. I was very young at the time. The youngest teacher, I think, in, yeah, sure, in Brenner. How did I arrive there? The principal of the school was very far from religion, like Zalman Aram. His name was Yitzhak Meisler, Zichroli Vracha. I speak about 50 years ago. He said to me, I was born in Lemberg, Lvov. Galicia, today Ukraine. Never my students learned the Tanakh with a Jewish traditional interpretation. They never heard the word Rashi, who speaks Ibn Ezra and Ramban. I know, but they don't. Same story. I need, at least for the last year, before the metric examinations, a teacher of your kind. I, at the time, didn't pass yet the metric examinations myself. <coughs> In the yeshiva, you don't learn metric. Mathematics, English. I told him, I don't have the certificate, I don't have the diploma. He said, 
Antwoorden. Minister of Education at that year was Abba Evin, that you have heard the name, the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations and to Washington. He gave me a license of one year in the condition that in this year you have to pass externist the matrix, six professions, English, mathematics, Hebrew, literature, history, Tanakh, and Talmud. I came there, and I had students of about 17, 18. I was five, six years older. At the end of the year, one of the best students, Moshe Torem, came to me in the party of the end of the year, Everyone held a book, a present, and a picture of all the teachers and students of that year. They said to me, Israel, can you give me an hour of your time? I said, you know that I live in Tel Aviv. I used to come every day by bus. I said, I will go wherever you tell me. But before I joined the army, in 10 days from now, for three years, there is some questions that bothered me a lot, and I need your help to answer this question. I said to him, I will give you an hour, even more, but tell me what is the issue. Very simple. There was Moshe Rabbeinu or not? Did he exist, Moshe, or not? This bothered me. And my name is Moshe. I took him inside. It was the party. I said, why do you ask such a question? I said, what? I had several teachers in Tanakh during the 12 years. There was a teacher, a lady teacher, she said, Moshe was a leader in Kush, about, among the Negroes. And he was like Spartacus and Garibaldi and Bolivar. He was the fighter for freedom, Martin Luther King. <laughs> but the fighter, not the speaker. He wasn't a great speaker. The fighter. That's Moshe. They told him. We have adopted him as a Jewish leader. He wasn't a Jew. This is one of my teachers. Another teacher told us at the gymnasium already, that Moshe is an idealistic leader in vision. Never happened in reality. It's a vision. The story gave him a father named Amram. The story have <laughs> discovered a mother called Yocheved. It never happened. The story with the daughter of Pero saved him from the Nile and gave him the name Moshe. I took him out of the water. This is a story, a nice story. To describe an image of an idealistic leader. I cannot describe you more teachers that I had. You came to the last year before the metric examinations. Look, and you told me, you speak to us about Moshe as a personality in history, as well as I'm sure that there was a Napoleon Bonaparte. So tell me, I'm confused. My social economy situation of my family is not very good. 
So I don't believe that after three years of army service, I will have the opportunity to study wherever, whatever in my life. This is my last day in life in the school. Before I go to life, to the real life, give me an answer. Convince me. Was Moshe or it was not? You understand the problem now? This is a good example. And this was asked in 1961, 55 years ago. The situation didn't improve since then. 55 years ago already, a boy born in Petah Tikva, in Eretz Israel, not from Soviet Union, not from Ethiopia. In Hebrew schools, 12 years after three years in kindergarten. And he is confused. Haya Moshe or Lo Haya Moshe? Tagid. What would you answer? How would you convince him that I am Moshe? I have invited him to our house in Tel Aviv, Peretz 18. Fourth floor, 75 stairs with no elevator. <laughs> this was, we had two rooms. In one of the two rooms, Moshe Torem came in. It was the summer vacation to have a private lesson about the issue, Haya or Lo Haya Moshe. What did I answer? You want to hear the answer? Ah. <laughs> but it's late. <laughs> I took the point that he mentioned himself, Napoleon Bonaparte. As I'm sure that there was such a person, you are sure that there was Moshe. So I asked him, tell me, Moshe, how do you know that Napoleon Bonaparte is a real figure? Did you meet him? Did you see him on the television? Did you see a picture of him in a newspaper? Did anyone in our generation met him? One person. No. He said, well, what's the question? He said, this is history. Ah, I kept the word. What is history? Story. 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 History. How does it create? How does it build in history? Grandfather lived together with his son. 30 years. 30 years he had time to tell him. The father lived with his son also. 30, 40, sometimes even 50 years. He had the occasion, 50 years, to tell what he had heard from his father. The chain is unbroken. And all of us knew, know, the story of a boy from Corsica, Napoleone, Bonaparte, Paris, Russia, he failed, Waterloo, Australis, and he ended in the island of Elbe, 1815. You're right, you're right. This is history. In all the books of history, no one saw him. But the story is for sure. OK, let's go back. We are now in Paris in 1800. At the time that Napoleon Bonaparte is the emperor of France, going to conquer all Europe. When we are in Paris 1800, someone will come to us and tell us, you know, 300 years ago, exactly in 1492, Columbus discovered America. 300 years ago. You are very young, you Americans. A young nation. 
the same year the Jews were expelled from Spain. Erev Tishabav. The king was Ferdinand. The queen was Isabella. The head of the Inquisition, the Catholic Church, was Thomas Torquemada in Marchebo. This happened 300 years ago. And we are walking in Paris, 1800. Napoleon is in his palace, in his headquarters. And someone come to tell us about 300 years ago. We will ask him, how do you know? He said, it's a part of the history, of the story. I have heard it from my teacher. My teacher and historian, he have heard it from his teachers in the university, in Barcelona, in Cordova, in Toledo. Madrid didn't exist yet. This happened 300 years, only 300, 300 years, a few generations. The world is not cut in mid the meanwhile. It's the same world, going from one generation to another, mid door to door. Uh -huh. So you are sure that Columbus discovered America and the Jews were expelled from Spain. So we are already in 1492. This is the end of the mid-aged, according to the historians. The start of the mid-age was 476, past era. What happened in 476? The Roman Empire was split into two pieces, east and west. East ruled by Antoninus, west ruled by Octavianus. And this is the start of the new era. Yemei HaBeinaim started. If you believe in 1492, you must believe in 476. I'm there, he said. I'm with you. He said, Moshe, we are already in the day when the empire of Roma was split. And it's undoubtedly, no question about it. Everyone knows the history. Only 400 years before, Titus came from Jerusalem. 70 years past era, he destroyed the second Beit HaMikdash, and they built in his honor the gate of Titus, which exists till this very last day in Roma. And you see the menorah on the shoulders of the people, the refugees, carrying the menorah from Beit HaMikdash. Do you believe that it happened? Sure. Everyone knows Titus Gate, Shar Titus, the menorah, Urbanabai, Titus, son of Aspasianus. Aspasianus became the emperor. Titus was the general who destroyed the Beit HaMikdash. Ah, so we are already in Bait Sheni, Beit HaMikdash. From Bayit Sheni to Bayit Rishon, backwards, only 70 years, two generations. In the Bible itself, there is a description. So the elderly people from Babel came with Ezra and Nehemiah to Jerusalem, and they built Bayit Sheni, and they cried, cried, because it's not the same like Bayit Rishon. Bayit Rishon is gold, cedars, King Solomon, very rich. He built Bayit Rishon. Bayit Sheni, some Olim Hadashim, <laughs> new immigrants from Iraq, not Iraq of Saddam Hussein, but Iraq of Babel. They came to build. And the old people, they were only 80 years old, only. Young, hallelujah. 70 years ago, they were children of 10 years. They remembered Aliyah Regel, Chaga Sukkot, Chaga Pesach, Chaga Shavuot. So we are already by attrition. The word is not cut in between. From by attrition, King Solomon, back to Exodus by Moshe Rabbeinu. 480 years. <coughs> Tell me, Moshe, there was a flood in the meantime? The world was destroyed? 
or the chain of history is unbroken. If you believe in Napoleon Bonaparte, in the same line, you must believe in Moshe. He kissed me. He was happy. He had an answer. The Akdama of Minchas Chinuch, Sefer Chinuch, there's something about it, around it. The Baron of in Barcelona. Now, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, the issue of the conflict, there is a conflict between all kinds of religion, religious Jews, and all kinds, they are not the same, of secular, is a real conflict. In Israel, it's even more difficult than in diaspora. Because we want it to be a Jewish state, democratic, but Jewish. By the way, in the independence scroll, the word democracy doesn't appear even once. The word Jewish appears 12 times. Jewish state, and Ben-Gurion read the scroll. Not the rabbi. The first prime minister and defense minister, the founder of the state. We hear in the spirit of the prophets, we declare the very existence of a Jewish state called Medinat Israel. The word Israel for the Medina was born in that moment because it was empty in the scroll because there was no decision before what will be the name of the state, newborn state. There were three options. One said, Eretz Israel, this is the name. The other said, Zion. And the other, the third one was Yehuda. Eretz Israel, or Zion, or Israel. Ben Gurion was Ben Gurion. He had decided in the moment, and he himself he didn't discuss anybody, he didn't consult anyone, and he wrote in Israel. Eretz Israel is too long. Israel. And this morning we spoke in Shul, what is the meaning of Israel? Bekitzer. In such a state that has to be a Jewish state for Israel, it's very, very difficult problem. Why? When he fell in love, a boy, with a converted girl, or a divorced girl, woman. He comes to the rabbinate. This is the only place where you are registered for marriage, the rabbinate. He said, I want to marry her. She loves me. She wants to... What's your name? Kohen. Kohen. A Kohen cannot marry a divorced woman. This is the law. Or you keep it or not. He becomes my enemy. That boy, he will not forgive me. I served in the army. I was a paratrooper. I, I love you. I embrace you. But I can't help you. I will not spoil the tradition. I will not cut the heritage. This is our fundament. This is our identity. Here, he doesn't apply to the rabbi. Or he applies to someone called rabbi, who is not a rabbi, but he will make it. Not in Israel. The problem. We want a face of a Jewish state. There is no public transportation. El Al doesn't fly on Shabbat. The train doesn't go on Shabbat, and the public buses don't go on Shabbat. He says, I am poor, I don't have a private car, and I don't have money for a taxi, a special taxi. I need a bus. But this is a Jewish state. We have to feel that it's Shabbat. 
atmosphere of Shabbat. I buy enemies. Here you don't have the problem. You don't face it. If you want to enter to a kosher restaurant, God forbid, if not, you have another one. We have it also in Israel because this is not public. This is not the state. It's a private business. So one has such a one, another one. The hotels are kosher because the hotel understands without religious tourists from Israel or from abroad, he has no existence. He will not survive. So we ask for a certificate of kosher. But the restaurants are all kinds, all kinds. French, Italian, Chinese, whatever. The problem is a very big problem. There is only one key of answer. Learning. Education. It's a long way, but the only one. No laws. If you can make a law not to sell bread on Pesach, that's right. But today with the fridge, you buy the bread before Pesach, you put it in the fridge, and you can eat all the Pesach, God forbid, to eat bread in the micro, it will be warm, it will be soft, no problem. Today, this is not the issue. The issue is to understand why is it important to keep the cash flow close. Why do we need a mikvah? And what is the shul so important? Even the Nazis, forgive me for the example, understood that this is the heart of the Jewish nation. If you want to help the Jews, the first step they did was Crystal Night. Ten months before World War II broke out, on November 9, 1938, they destroyed in one night thousand and hundred different schools all over Germany. Only in Germany, throughout Germany, 1,100 schools destroyed and the Torah scrolls burned in the flames 10 months before the war. Four years before the final solution became real. But they understood if you want to break the Jews, to break their moral, so they will not think about the Bible, whatever, destroy the heart. The heart of the Jews is the shul, the synagogue. When I tell it to my students in Israel, secular, we didn't think about it. We said, but the Nazis were very, very, very calculated, very smart, unfortunately. They knew it. They made the investigations. How can we break the morale of the Jewish people, destroying the shul? Everything is a question of learning, of education, of knowledge, and experiences. Just to know from books is too dry. Yiddishkeit is something that you have to feel it also. To involve the knowledge with emotions. To know about the Shabbat is very good. But to feel Shabbat, you have to go to a Jewish religious family to see Shalom Aleichem, Eishet Chaim, Kiddush, Amotzi, Zmirot, Parashat HaShavua, Haftarat HaShavua, go with them to the shul. Ah, Shabbat. After Havdalah, you have a new week. You come to listen to Rav Lau, you have time, you enjoy, I hope so, and you will ask me to come next time. I'm not sure that I can do it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, sir.